Welcome to the InfoMullet YouTube channel. If you enjoy this content, please like or share. And if you'd like to support the InfoMullet by becoming a mulleteer, visit us on Patreon. We appreciate your support. Welcome to the InfoMullet. Uh, Wednesday, Facebook Live, Ask Me Anything. My name is Timothy Clancy, your chief mulleteer. This is Bonky, the emotional support donkey. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, if you haven't yet, like and follow the InfoMullet Facebook page. Uh, be sure to share the video out on your feed. That way uh, people see it. We're going to be going over some topics that I'm sure are of much discussion on many feeds. So hopefully this will be useful. And uh, I wanted to start out uh, where we kind of left last week. We did a lot of discussion last week on the system structure of riots. And I talked about the dictator's dilemma and how the system structure would drive this escalating street battles if there continued to be confrontation. But I also gave a hope or a forecast that we had seen the peak of the violence. And when I describe violence here, I'm talking about you know violent arrests, uh, violent looting, rioting, things like that. I think we had seen the peak of that. And I wanted to follow up today because I've collected some data from a few disparate sources, which kind of um, illustrate the interaction between uh, the perceived violence of something, protest sizes and things like that. And I think it, it speaks to the street battle that if you get caught in this dictator's dilemmas, bad things happen, but if you can avoid it, you actually get a uh, better outcome. So I wanted to start first with um, looking at what we know now from the, the, the riots. So, um, you know, the riots, the, the protests, excuse me, the protests started May 25th have been going on and there was a period of, of associated violence with these protests. There's been a debate who caused what, what was escalating. But this chart shows sort of what I would call the violent aspects of the riots. On the left side is the number of deaths. On the right is the arrests. Um, and you can see here, if we, we, and the calendar at the bottom is sort of the dates, uh, George Floyd is murdered on the 25th of May. So this is really when the activity starts. And you can see here, I've, I've tracked the deaths by by type of person killed as best we can know. I'm getting this data from a lot of different sources and sometimes it's a lot known, but you can see here, there's, even though there are deaths and those deaths are serious, we're talking about a handful of deaths a day peaking at a certain point and then declining. Associated with that, a massive increase in arrests, which is a, a escalatory tactic. And between the some of the protests uh when they they changed at night and different folks came in there was looting and there was definitely looting i'm not trying to say there wasn't um you have violence between people defending their stores and perhaps looting it you have violence between the police escalating with the protesters the protesters reacting to the escalations you had this increase of violence um that began really within a few days but really began escalating i, I call it the bloody weekend here right friday may 30th was the night in Atlanta that you had very peaceful riots turn almost like that into a violent confrontation in as little bit as a half hour. And there were a couple, like there was um, some police officers dragged and tased some college students out of their car. They've since been not only fired, but arrested. The Saturday was pretty bad and then, or excuse me, the Sunday. And then going to June 1st, this is Lafayette Park. This has become the sort of crystallized moment of overreaction in the street battle where President Trump used um, federal officers of a variety of agencies to sort of clear Lafayette Park that it was before curfew. It hadn't been curfew yet. It had been a peaceful protest, but he wanted to do a photo op at the church and he sort of cleared it. And what you see also is behind the scenes here, everyone sort of focuses on the deaths here. You have this massive increase in arrests coinciding with that. And um, the total deaths were accumulating here in red over time. And you can kind of see the breakdown in the mix. Most people who are dying in these protests are protesters. That tells you the danger of the police response, but they're not the only ones. The law enforcement are dying as well. We have a law enforcement office here dying um, and one dying this last Sunday. I talked about that on the domestic terrorism. You also have a lot of unknown, the green. These are people who may, we don't know specifically what category they fell in. They may have just been bystanders caught up in the mix. That happens a lot when these, these protests and police are moving back and forth throughout the city. But you definitely had a peak of violence on the first. And then over the three or four days after that, you saw a rapid pullback of uh, heavy police presence. And you can see that drop off here dramatically as the arrests per day plummet down. I mean, we're talking thousands of arrests a day here dropping down to only a few hundred, and the deaths decline as well. There's a relationship between the, I mentioned in The Dictator's Dilemma, there's a definite relationship between the severity of the response 
made on these protests and the overall levels of violence. And it's not a who side, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, protesters push too far will end up rioting. They might end up, they might later uh, have, have looting going on. You might have unassociated folks taking advantage of a protest. So peaceful protests happen, but then people who are criminal element take advantage of that with looting. You have store owners trying to defend their stores. Some of them have died. So you see this overall violence, but we have to put it in context. Overall, as of that I can find out to my best information, 22 people have died over two weeks. So we have to keep in context that this isn't like nationwide bloodshed with hundreds dying. It's, it's tragic that it happens. And again, most of the people who have been killed are protesters or, or bystanders that protest. But we need to put this in perspective. And you see a lot of people trying to make the argument that um, everyone dying is law enforcement or everyone dying is protest. Well, it's a mix, right? This is the breakdown of who we know that's died so far, the 22 people that have died. Eight of them have been protesters, six of them are unknown, four are confirmed looters, uh, two were law enforcement, and two were store personnel, either an owner or a guard hired to protect the store. So these riots that associate um, violent riots are dangerous. They're highly dynamic. They're very fluid. There's a lot of different parties. We talked about this last week. There's a lot of different things going on in these, uh, these activities that associate. When the riots get associated with the protests, they become very fluid and very dangerous. But this looks at the relation between the overall protest size and the amount that is, you know, violence. And I think this is the part that's being missed is there's a tendency in the media because if it bleeds, it leads. Obviously, for political purposes, both on the left and the right, there's this desire to depict a certain perspective of violence. On the left, they want to say, you know, the police are cracking down and, and, and killing people at all protests. The, on the right, they want to say, well, the, the, the protesters are turning into looters and there's nationwide mayhem. What's important to understand is that the overwhelming majority of protests were nonviolent. And you can look at this from the sizing chart here. So what I've added is the total deaths in red, which again, flatline at 22, um, which really was the last one I think was Saturday. You have the arrests now are scaled and you can see the arrests here per day. What's over the top of this is the daily attendance, the number of people protesting by best estimate. Now I've got this from a website that's linked in the sources. It's a little bit lagging. So um, I only have data through the 7th of June and it will probably, if you go back and look each day, it's updating constantly. So these numbers here, the 5th, 6th, and 7th may increase more, but I'm pretty comfortable that these numbers early are more accurate and it will keep improving its accuracy goes along. Well, this is the relation of violence and protest. You see here, the, the protest went up very high, very quickly, but when that violence broke out on the bloody weekend, it dropped right back down and, and got to a lower level sustained there and then increased as the violence began waning the protest size began increasing and we're seeing a lot of large protests now that are largely peaceful we're seeing some with numbers of 60,000 100,000 um things of that size in nature and it really goes to show that i think there is room for protests to be nonviolent civil peaceful and you don't need confrontation police to get there either it's there's a mix of escalatory tactics when it comes to uh, you know, believing a, a protest, it, you know, again, chicken and the egg. If you believe a protest will go violent and you put in a heavy police force and the protesters believe that heavy police force will attack them, you've got a combustible situation that is going to spark some tensions or at least going to have opportunity for it. Whereas if you pull the police back, you give space, you allow the protest to occur and the focus can be more on the sustainable change. Um, if you think about where are the protests now in terms of mass movements? Um, those protest size I was able to calculate, they're right now at about 500 to 600,000 people in total have pro attended protests from the beginning through June 7th. And again, that number is probably low just because it's very hard to account for every protest in a small town, but you could see it was tracking hundreds of different protests. Um, so let's say that number's low by a factor of three. There's 1.5 million people who have protested. When we use Chenoweth's number of what it takes to get a mass movement to create nonviolent change, the threshold effect is 3.5% of the population. So 3.5% of 320 million people, you're talking close to 12 million people. You can see the gap, even as 
major and, and sort of all encompassing in the media as these protests and the reform movements that have come on top of them are, you can see the gap that still remains in terms of mass mobilization. What is truly mass mobilization look like and how much 3.5% of the population is when it mobilizes, how much force that is, even nonviolent force to drive for change. Um, so it's, it's, it's something with these protests. I'm glad to see that the violence is down. I'm glad President Trump got rebuked by the military and his use of the Insurrection Act. That was a concern last week. Almost universal condemnation across the board from the military. All the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary, um, Chief of Staff, and uh, Sergeant Major of the Service, Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, Marines, uh, National Guard, all of them came out very strongly against the use of the Insurrection Act. You saw former generals like General Mattis weigh in. I think that that rebuke of the Insurrection Act, as well as the realization from a lot of municipalities and counties that these, these local heavy police responses weren't working, led to that pullback last week where the violence begins declining, the arrests begin declining. It's a virtuous cycle, right? Again, it's not, it's not which came first because this is very interwoven. It's not like the police had to withdraw first and then the protesters got peaceful or there, you know, there was no rioting. It's a mix of things. The protesters themselves saw, we don't want it to go this way. And are, you can see videos all over where they're trying to police themselves and keep some of the looting and vandalism in check. Um, so uh, looking through this real quick, let me say hi to a couple people. Michael, Kevin, George, Lucas, good to see you. Joe, welcome. Um, yeah, Lucas was asking, have you seen or do you have access? How many protests are out in total and the number, size, location of the individual protests? That's the chart that will be on the video that I showed. I think total is, of that chart is about 500,000 since it began. Again, that number is probably low by a factor of three, but I wouldn't... Um, uh, John, the, the ratio of LEO versus civilians in terms of ratio, that's a, that's a data question that there's just not sufficient data on. There's no data source of how many police uh, were present at each individual uh, interaction. I think that's, that's probably what you're looking for. There are some ratios when it comes to policing ratios and counterinsurgency of what you need to police a, a hostile environment. Um, I think the policing ratio for a, a normal civil um, stable country is about one through 500 or something like that, one through a thousand, I don't know, something like that. But when it gets to counterinsurgency, when you're talking a, a truly unstable country like Afghanistan, Iraq, it's more like one to 75. Um, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't read too much of the deaths as in terms of ratios, other than saying that, especially with a small count, you're talking 22 deaths among protests of at least 500,000 and at least 40,000 National Guard deployed and at least probably 100,000 police, 50,000 police. I don't know. I mean, a lot. Um, so, uh, Kevin, the, Kevin has a question here. The Department of Justice saying that some foreign actors were deliberate, deliberately aggravating the protest to cause violent escalation. So this is a good point. There's been this concept of the agent provocateur um, entering the riots. And there's been two versions of this, one of which Kevin says is that it's a foreign agent provocateur, and the other of which is it's domestic agent provocateur. And you can see these on both sides. For the, for the red side, it's going to be Antifa is driving around and, and, and making these viol uh, protests more violent. For the blue side, it's going to be white supremacists or accelerationists are going around. Um, and then, of course, there's the Department of Justice that's saying foreign agents are driving this. Well, let's first of all handle the foreign one that Kevin talked about. Um, I think most of the foreign influence into the country is, is as it has been for a while, and that is um, using social media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube videos, um, fake accounts, bots, all those things to generate outrage and things like that. You can go to Hamilton 68. I should probably do a video on it at some point. I've done some media literacy. Hamilton 68 tracks all of this stuff. They track the Russia and the China. They do some with Iran. And you can search and you can see certain taglines that rise and fall that are associated with foreign controlled accounts or what are believed to be foreign backed accounts. So that's the foreign side. I don't think there are any foreign agents here. Um, I think that's a little bit, and, and this whole concept of the agent provocateur, I don't buy into for the most part. Um, I think there's more than enough causal plausible explanation in every local community to account for, you know, every local community is going to have activist groups, police, good and bad. Um, Criminals who are going to take advantage for looting, store owners who want to defend themselves. 
all of these groups are in every community and they're going to mix and interact. But the second argument, the domestic, I want to touch on that because there, the Trump had mentioned Antifa was doing this and there had been a concern on the blue. You have to remember, no one knew this was coming other than, you know, the standpoint of if another unarmed black man is killed in police custody and there's a mass riot, there will be protests. But on May 25th, if you were an agent provocateur as a group, you would have to have a plan to send your troops, your, your, your agent provocateurs, to dozens of cities as this began to spread. And they would have to be effective in places that they may not be native to or strangers of. And none of the groups that are sort of uh, tagged with being provocateurs have demonstrated that level of capability, both on the right and the left. Um, most of these sort of extreme groups that, that practice violence, you know, in, in various forms, are largely capable of doing planned street battles or confrontations that are months or weeks in advance. And this is like Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville or some of the Portland demonstrations where there's a clear demonstration that's been called. There's knowledge for weeks or months in advance and both sides kind of funnel in there. None of them have demonstrated a contingent capability and a contingent, I mean, something happens and you react to it quickly. And we're talking about a level of planning that's like the Tet Offensive here, you know, hitting multiple cities at once, getting your people in all those areas, getting into the right positions where they can cause the, the difficulties, I think is a real stretch on the plausibility. But we did have one case, and I, I post an article on the Infamil, we have had a, a sort of verified domestic terror incident that was an Air Force sergeant who killed a um, federal officer outside a courthouse on May 29th. Uh, injured another was a drive-by attack. And then on Saturday, when he was cornered, he killed a local sheriff's officer, wounded two more, was eventually caught. Um, he has been sort of, the evidence for me is pretty clear. He's a left-wing extremist. He espouses left-wing, not Antifa, but sort of the anti-fascist police brutality sort of memes. But there's no indication he's working with anyone else. He's what you would call a lone wolf operator. And these lone wolves are, they'll, they'll be around and they happen. They tend to be fairly rare. Um, but they they do exist. So let me say some hellos. Even Sinead. Um, Laura's talking about the size of the protest. Yep, Sarah. Jennifer, good to see you. Jeremy. Um, Stefan, you may have come in late. The chart is updating continuously. So I said that I expect the more recent dates to grow in size as more data accumulates, whereas the past dates are probably more accurate. I suspect, given the nature of the method that's used to collect this, it's probably three times low. So where the charts may show um, 500,000 people have protested since now, uh, in total, it might be closer to 1.5 million. The protest last weekend might be off by a factor of three. I think that will um, build out over the next couple of days, but it's sort of, it's where I have it as of now. So tipping, uh, switching gears a little bit. I talked when talking about the dictator's dilemma of this grievance that, um, the grievance that lies under the latent system. So you think about the visible system, we see the riots, we see the protests, we see, um, what's going on. But driving that is the latent system, which is invisible. It's hard to see. It, it's not that it doesn't exist, but it's very hard to see. And this grievance that gets transformed into kinetic energy when um, protests happen, when riots happen, I call that the iceberg theory. You know, uh, George Floyd dies or Breonna Taylor dies or um, uh, Ahmoud dies or, or even back in Ferguson, Michael Brown dies. These are the tips of the iceberg. And even though those individual cases can be argued in a legal sense, right, wrong, or indifferent, uh, you know, just or unjust, I, I think obviously George Floyd was murder. Breonna Taylor was a SWAT police uh, raid in the wrong house. I mean, you have hard to argue those. But getting away from arguing the individual points, it's important to recognize that these trigger points on the ice are just the very, very tip of a large iceberg. And what I wanted to show was something, I've done a lot of work on systemic um, disparities uh, in violence, because my research is in violence and instability. And it's important to understand what this iceberg looks like. So what I wanted to do was make the iceberg visible. And that's not easy, because the data is kind of like, reporters don't think in this way, a lot of sociologists sort of get this, but their, their data is not accessible, hidden in journals. So what I wanted to do is start with the tip of the iceberg. This is from the Washington Post, um, uh, police shooting database. They have, in 2015, they began tracking every police shooting they could find in the U.S. It had been a very opaque subject. We didn't have a lot of good data. Police agencies were naturally very reluctant to share. 
And we didn't know how many times people were being shot, how many were black, how many were white, how many were unarmed. There wasn't good data except for a, a persistent data, except for occasional research. This is what um, the Washington Post currently has as the stats. You know, you can see here, this is a per capita per million. And before people ask questions, I'm going to go through a lot here. So hold the questions until can I get it? Because because I know a lot of, well, what about this? Well, we'll get to that. So this is the tip of the iceberg. This is the deaths the disparate deaths by police interactions. And you can see here that blacks 31 per million die from um, police interaction over 1200 killed in total versus whites are 13 per million. So you're talking about a disparity. Now, keep in mind, more whites are being killed by number, but the, the white population is also three times the size of the black population. So what we're looking at is a per capita that adjusts for their population and the disparity is the difference between these experiences. If, if everything was equal and normal, um, you would have the same amount per population, you know, if you, you assume it's just a normal statistical random distribution, it should not be affected by race. And this clearly shows it is affected by race. Blacks kill, killed at um, not quite three times the rate. Hispanics are almost twice the rate. And this, this, this trend has been going on all five years the Washington Post has been recording this. Um, it's interesting. Every year, about 1,000 people are killed by the police. Now, a lot of these, most of them, are justified shootings. The, you can go to the Washington Post database, and you can look up every single shooting. They have a lot of criteria to say, you know, was the suspect fleeing the scene? Was it an armed confrontation or felonious stop or violence was involved, you know, attacked the police? Was it unarmed? Was it a random stop? Was it just a, you know, a search? And I think the ones that, you know, obviously drive the media, George Floyd was a $20 counterfeit bill that we're not even sure if he knew was counterfeit. Um, you know, the, the same thing with uh, in New York City, uh, in, in um, Breonna Taylor. Uh, these, so a lot of these deaths are not necessarily high risk situations where you, I mean, Breonna Taylor was a SWAT team, but a lot of the other ones are just normal everyday interactions that end up with death. And the police here are, again, about a thousand a year, pretty consistent over all five years that we've been tracking. Um, so the, when we look though, the rate of deaths, we can talk about the rate of deaths with police interaction as a rate per encounter. And, um, you know, you can think about for every 10,000 times a population encounters the police, what's the rate of injury and fatality? And a big arguing point that's out there right now is that per 10,000 police encounters, Racial difference doesn't make a lot of difference. And you can see that here. I put in the upper left, these are white non-Hispanic, uh, upper right, uh, black blacks, lower left, white Hispanic, and lower right, Native American. These are the designations that are used in the research for the major ethnic groups. And you can see here, injured per 10,000 stops and arrests and fatal per 10,000 stops and arrests, 1.5 people are injured per 10,000 stops and arrests, 0.7 are killed. For white, about the same for black, pretty close for white, Hispanic much lower for Native American, but the note in the research was that that was um, believed to be by bad reporting that the they weren't getting all the data into the uniform crime report. This is based off the FBI uniform crime report. So people will argue, hey, yeah, you're saying that, you know, the rates aren't that different per 10,000. So why is this a big deal? Well, this is the iceberg. You can make the iceberg visible. It's the number of police interactions with that population before you get to the point that you, you'd use the uh, 10,000 that matters. So what this shows is the, this is the iceberg, right? This is the funnel. The systemic funnel I talk about is we do more arrests and stops for um, other races than we do for white. So again, same block. If you're white, there will be 355 arrests per 10,000 and about 148 stops per 10,000. That's the baseline for the white, uh, white Americans. But if you're black, you will be arrested, uh, there are arrests 1,100 per uh, 10,000 and 217 stops. Now remember, a stop doesn't always result in arrest. This can be stopped, a harassment, and let go. But many of the deaths have occurred on these sort of small stops, small issue stops, the bumper's off, the light's broken. Um, you took a run, you know, you were going a little bit too fast. And you can see here that the arrests per 10,000, the interactions with the police, and these are per 10K population. So blacks are almost three, again, four times more likely to have a police interaction or arrest. Sure, once you have an interaction with the police, the rates are about the same, but there's a lot more interactions with blacks with the police than with other, with the white. Same thing with Hispanics. There are almost twice as much and Native Americans as well 
much higher. So these are the systemic funnels, and this is nationwide. The, the, the research this article comes from, is it's, it's linked in the comments. The, when I talk about the tip of the iceberg, right, this is the actual iceberg. Uh, George Floyd may be down here in a fatal encounter, but the community that he lives in is dealing with these disparate arrests and stops per 10,000. And this is spread out over the entire United States. When you go to a city that ends up being a flashpoint like Ferguson, Baltimore, Minneapolis, you want to look at the iceberg in that city. And because the Department of Justice investigations that happened after the Michael Brown shooting, we have a good idea of the iceberg in Ferguson as it existed um, when this when the, 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 the protest came up about Michael Brown. So what I want to do next is show the... Um, this is Ferguson, and it's, it's simply comparing whites and blacks now. In Ferguson, it's not a big town. It's only like 20,000 people. Um, the charges per 10,000 for whites are about 8,700. This is the amount of times police charged people. Uh, there's only six, 7,000 whites in there. So again, this is a per capita. I don't want someone to say, well, that's, you know, per 10,000, there's not even 10,000 people in the city. It's adjusted. It's a normalizing thing, so we compare. But 8,700 per 10,000 whites were charged. 2,800 vehicles stopped, um, vehicle searches, about 142, and arrested as a result of the vehicle searches per 10,000 population, 114, right? So now look at the iceberg as black see it. Same city, same police force, same 10,000 populations it's normalized, but nearly two and a half times, maybe close, a little bit less than three times charges per 10,000 people. The vehicle stops per 10,000 over double, right? And the vehicle searches per 10,000, nearly six times as much. And the arrested as a result, again, six times. Now, someone's going to say, well, you know, maybe they were committing crime. You can look in the data. If they searched a vehicle in white stops, contraband was found 30% of the time. In black stops, 24%. So it's not that there are more criminality in these stops. It's the sheer number of stops and charges and searches and arrests. And this is the iceberg that fuels this grievance that then gets, you know, manifested um, when someone like Michael Brown gets shot. Now, there is, a, you know, the, the shooting itself was later determined to be self-defense. And I think there is a good argument that was a self-defensive shooting. But that doesn't discount the systemic disparate policing that's going on in the city itself. That doesn't discount this iceberg effect, which explains why it was reacted the way it did. You cannot look at these um, interactions only as someone died, why is everyone so upset? Or, well, that was, turns out to be a valid death, but why is it? It's this iceberg here that goes on. And um, this is not limited just to Ferguson or um, certain type crime types. I've done this uh, study for many, many different types of crime. And in fact, does anyone want to guess what one of the most disparate, I mean, liberals are kind of in a, in, a, in a pinch here because they they come down on the side of Black Lives Matter, but they're often supporting causes that create these icebergs themselves. Does anyone want to guess what one of the top most disparate um, criminal prosecution types there are from racial disparity? It's going to surprise some people. Well, this is the entire United States, this is sentencing disparity now between blacks and Hispanics versus whites. And I point out the second highest one here, firearms. Almost as much as drugs. And in fact, in some cases, it's, it can be several times more than drugs. Everyone understands the drug war is bad. But what they don't understand is that the gun control effort is just as bad. Uh, and so this shows out the disparity of treatment between blacks and Hispanics versus white. This is the iceberg across all crimes. And you see, you know, if, if, you're, a, if you're a white person, I'm advising you stay away from these crimes down here because the, they're going to get you. Gambling, child pornography, environmental wildlife, food and drug. Yeah, make sure you're don't, don't be selling your whole milk there. But, you know, when you talk about disparate policing on violent crime, serious crime, it's almost always disparate against the minority populations, the ethnic populations. I think for firearms nationally, it's something like blacks and Hispanics make up 28% of the population, but get charged with something like 70% of the crimes for gun control violations. And this is just one manifestation of this iceberg, the hugely disparate policing. And it's not to say that um, whites don't commit firearm violations. I could go, you know, where I am right now, I could probably go in a three block area in a largely white area and find many firearm violations of unregistered firearms, uh, ammunition not held well. The trick is all those stops, those police interactions that are at the tip of the funnel, 
more searches, more stops, more vehicle stops, they lead into this arresting pattern that creates this disparity. So it's not that there is a higher criminality degree as a baseline among the population. It's that there's a higher policing on top of that um, that creates this disparate effect. And, and liberal states are not immune to this. I am a resident of Massachusetts and Massachusetts tends to have a problem of patting itself on the back and saying, well, we're not like those Southern states. And this is the Massachusetts racial disparity. Weapons and firearms, gun control in Massachusetts is the most disparate policing in the state. It's twice as disparate as drug offenses. Blacks and Hispanics, I think, only make up 12% of the population in Massachusetts, but account for something like 80% of the firearm enforcement. And you can see here how it breaks down. But these, this is not something that is um, as easily categorized when it comes to these laws and policing. It's not something that's as easily categorized, I think, as well It's South or urban or poor or anything like that, these things um, really cross the gamut. And so from the reform efforts you see coming out that are, they're largely targeted at the systemic funnel. And, you know, Campaign Zero uh, was came about probably three or four years ago. That is a series of reform for police behavior itself, body cameras, more community policing. Um, we have, people are saying they've been ineffective. And the problem with implementing something in a large bureaucracy like a nationwide police force is it takes time. I can see the argument they're ineffective because police officers are turning off their body cams or, or when there's a shooting, magically the body cameras are off. What we're seeing now though is because of those regulations, police are being um, uh, fired and or arrested for violating. The uh, Louisville police chief was fired because his troops had the body camera off when a civilian was shot by the police. And so I think there's an argument whether those reforms are, are doing enough, but when it comes to the hashtag defund the police, which is a horrible name, what they're really talking about is attacking that systemic funnel. It's about making sure the police aren't the, 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 the major interacting point with these communities when most of these stops are for petty things or they might be mental health issues or substance abuse issues or where services, the argument is we can decompose the police force from being the major social services provider for these poor communities, pull them back, save them for truly violent crime and, um, you know, murder, things like that. And, and then the, what's remaining, the funding that went for those police services will go better to social services. I don't know if I buy necessarily that you can ramp up social services to be that effective, to solve that. We have, these are major societal level issues, mental health, substance abuse, poverty, these are challenges. I don't think it's going to be as much as just shifting, but it's not a bad idea. Anything you can do to reduce that interaction weight, that encounter rate, especially when it's petty stuff, will have a cascade effect through the funnel of less stops, less searches, less arrests, less injuries, less hospitalizations, and less deaths. And that's probably where I think the defund the police movement is heading towards is to reduce those numbers of interactions. Um, but I, I think we need to be clear here. A lot of people are saying the flip side of the iceberg as well, the police are maintaining law and order. That's a very challenging argument to make if you look at the data um, in terms of like clearance rates. And I don't have the data here in front of me, but I may do it on a, a follow-up. The clearance rate for things like murders range between 40% and 60%. So we can argue that murders are hard, but for rapes, the clearance rate of police nationwide is like 20%. For a lot of burglary and property crimes, it's 15%. The, 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 the theory that police create law and order, I think is subject to valid debate at this point. They certainly are present and under extreme circumstances, yes, you, you, you wanna have like this domestic terrorism incident on Saturday where you know guys going around with IEDs and firearms, you need an armed response to that. But for the vast majority of interactions, that are non-criminal in nature, there's probably better services that can be used. And even for the ones that are criminal, they're generally documenting, collecting evidence, and then either sitting on it in a backlog of kits that they never get to, or not really effectively handling it. So I think the the protests, now that the violence has reduced associated with the you know riots, uh, police escalation, the protests are gaming stream, you're gonna see a shift to this disparate policing angle and the systemic funnel angle. And um, I think they're gonna move to decide about reforming. How do we get less police interactions? How do we eliminate some of these laws that, do we, that don't seem to be serving a purpose but are sort of enabling these, these um, activities? That's gonna be the focus going forward. So let me stop here and see if there's any questions. I just covered a lot with that and, and say some hello. James, good to see you.
Yep. Uh, yep. Kevin, Doug, drugs possession was close, but firearms was top in the disparity. Kimberly, good to see you, Ishmael. Uh, John asks, given the administrative jurisdictional patchwork in U.S. law enforcement, could a federal approach even work? Aren't we essentially stuck with local regional approach to change in police forces? Um, John, I answered this last week. I think the majority of reform effort is going to be bottoms up. You can talk about campaign zero. You can talk about city councils, mayors, city level action. There is something the federal government can do, which we, we saw both in Ferguson and Baltimore. It had a department that was very well staffed with experts that did investigations after these incidents. They went to Ferguson and they went to Baltimore and they created these reports. The link, the link to the Ferguson report is in the comments. I'd go check that out. This is like turning a federal spotlight to demonstrate the iceberg nature. And it's, I think it's best um, utility is twofold. One, it creates a record of what disparate policing actually looks like in total across the board, not just in deaths, not just in hospitalizations, but in um, it, basically the Ferguson police were looking, working like middle a uh, uh, medieval uh, sheriffs where they use the population a as a tax source for the nobles and they were collecting revenue and fees and things like that. And that's a huge light that's important to understand that these things exist. The second thing that the federal action can do is they can issue a consent decree. And that consent decree is a binding contract. The city has to agree to it. But once the city, the Ferguson agreed to their consent decree, they're in a contract with the Department of Justice. They're on the hook for making those reforms. And the, the, the downside right now is that department has been dismantled on the Trump administration. It could be re-brought up. And we could use the example of the Ferguson and Baltimore inquiries there should be one in Minneapolis that, you know, you can't do them in all cities, but you can certainly pick certain cities, Chicago, perhaps top of my list, um, you know, where you're, you want to see what is the nature of disparate policing? What is the nature of this iceberg? New York City, at Los Angeles, after this last weekend, anywhere you have these um, brutal police responses in relation and, and the longstanding allegations of disparate policing, the Department of Justice investigation is a useful federal tool to come in with a group of experts go top to bottom and, and document what's going wrong, what's going right, and put in a consent decree to fix it. Um, Rory asks, if we look at white on white homicides as comparable to other interracial homicides, if not, then wouldn't law enforcement target those racial neighborhoods at a higher rate of firearm weapon violation? This is a great question. Everyone asks this, it's very common. M Believe it or not, beginning with evolutionary science in the animal kingdom, the biggest threat to animals are their pure neighbors, the ones who are most like them. This carries forward into human societies. The biggest risk you're at are the ones who look, most act, look, act, and exist most like yourself. And this makes sense when you think about it. You know, the people you're more at risk of getting sexually assaulted by are actually in your family or neighbors or friends. They have access. They have proximity. They have um, they can exert grooming. Speaking of violent crime, crime occurs in the neighborhood you're in. And as we've had segregated communities, when we talk about racial crime, whites overwhelmingly kill other whites, blacks overwhelmingly kill other blacks. But, and it could be said that there is, people will often say, I think blacks kill blacks at 30% uh, more than whites kill whites. But they're, they're kind of doing a statistical trick there because the actual rate of deaths is a very, very small. It's something like if I said 99.99999% of blacks are not murderers and 99.99995% of whites are not murderers, that difference, yes, you could describe statistically that difference is white, you know, but that's such a small fraction that it's kind of playing with statistical Humana, humana. I've also, in the coastline of violence, gone to some length to describe why conditions are violent in communities that blacks live in. And I use Chicago as an example. And it's not that blacks are more violent, it's that the policies we put in place in the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, redlining, um, destruction of neighborhood with freeways, uh, restrictive HOA covenants, all of these accumulated racist policies against blacks are the kinds of things that create conditions which enable violence, fragmented communities, low investment, poverty, you know, the, the drug war, obviously. So I, I think it's, it's a, the, the race on race um, killing rate is only, I think, one aspect that you need to look in a little closer. Yes, statistically, blacks are more likely to kill blacks and, and whites are more likely to kill whites. And between the two, blacks are a little bit more likely than whites. But there's a lot of reasoning for that that I think doesn't go to some racial thing. It just happens to do with the, the racist policies we've used against them in those communities. Um, 
so yeah, seeing some good notes. I, I think the Ferguson report and the Baltimore report should be required reading in high school because it's 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 a great education in how um just it was an eye opener for me. I mean, I learned a lot doing it. Yeah, uh, Newark is under a consent decree as well. Laura brings up a good point. Some of these these consent decrees, there's a lot of them out there, but the two I know from specifically. Um, I don't know what Jay's responding to in 30. So, uh, uh, Jay, I don't know what you're responding to with 30 about seven. Um, I don't know if that's in response to someone else or something I said. But so that's that's the systemic funnel. That's the disparity that's going on and the systemic funnel. This is, again, all in the latent system. You're not going to see it just looking at protests. You're not going to see it just looking at if you just focus on uh, an unarmed death. You're not going to see this systemic thing. You've got to look deeper through one of the reports or some of these stats, which um, I have the sort of the access to. So um, if you're joining us, hopefully like, follow, share the info mullet. Um, if you haven't yet become a military subscriber, www.patreon.com slash info mullet. We talk about a wide variety of topics, trying to bring more context. This is, we're getting a little bit away from COVID, but we'll get back to it here in a sec, but these are important things. So if you like this and want to see more of this, please become a Patreon subscriber. It helps us out a great deal. Um, so, oh yeah, 7%, got it, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's I'm pulling those numbers off the top of my head. Usually I, it's exaggerated 30%, but um, it's not that much. And it's not that much of a small, you know, it's one of the things if, 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 if uh, one of the, the great tricks of statistical uh, skullduggery is to take something that's very, very statistical rare and compare it to something else that is also very statistically rare and point out that one is slightly less rare than the other and say, haha, X percent difference between the two. It's still, you need to think of the effect. They're both very statistically rare. Great, great point, Jay. So, um, Let's do a little bit uh, switch to COVID. Um, so we talked about Bangladesh on Saturday and how it had gotten caught with this crude fatality rate. Um, they were one-upped by Brazil uh, on Friday, last, last Friday. Brazil just stopped reporting all COVID-related deaths. And they're doing this because they have become the third worst country in the world on very rapidly. I mean, it, like it took the US and the UK a consolidated amount of effort to screw things up as badly as we did. But Brazil's like, hold my, hold my beer or whatever they drink down there. And it is coming on charging hard. So what President Bolsonaro did, and I'll never pronounce that name correctly. So correct, feel free to correct me in the comments. What President Bolsonaro did is he simply stopped reporting all COVID cases, all COVID deaths. He would only report what happened that day. And it, you had to have been confirmed within 24 hours after death. And this caused a real backlash. I think the third, the, they've had, I think, three health ministers resign just during the course of the pandemic. Currently, it's a military general with zero experience in health-related issues. And I think just this morning I was looking, they did bring back up the... Um, the, uh, the reporting, but now it's got a question of, is it gonna be right, is it gonna be wrong? And there's a real, you know, we worry about instability here in the US. Brazil has a history of coups, and there's a, there's a real potential another military coup might happen because there's such a tension now between sort of this authoritarian populist President Bolsonaro, the, and there was a lot of issues even before COVID that were, were driving this, inst this, this tension. Now with the COVID response, they're up to, I think, 34,000 deaths, and the UK is only at 40,000. They're probably going to overtake them. They had 30,000 new cases. I mean, they're just, it's, it's, it's really showing they're, they're the leader of the new beer seven in terms of the, the countries that are potentially at the end of the day going to be worse than the U.S. But the U.S., have no fear, the U.S. is still number one in deaths, right? Go, go U.S. So I haven't done this in a while. We had the riots, the protests, all the concern about that. So I just wanted to show that, yes, we are still losing between 500 and 1,000 people a day um, to coronavirus. It has continued this steady decline. Um, but it has not gone away by any stretch of the imagination. I showed last week how we were already undergoing outbreak conditions, uh, wave 1.5 before the protest started. You throw 500,000, a million, two million people into protest conditions, even if they're wearing masks, even if they're trying to socially distance, which not all will or can or whatever, you're going to have uh, another, you know, you're going to have bad conditions. So um, 
This shows the death rate. We're up now to about 111,000 deaths. We're still on track, unfortunately, to be about 140,000 um, by August, uh, July or August. So this, uh, unlike other countries that did the hammer and the dance and you saw a drop off, we're just in this long, slow bleed, um, unfortunately. And it's, it's, it, I, I want to give credit to Tyler Brown, who has been watching this RT Live website. I shared this website, RT Live, which was to track state level outbreaks. And he was on there every day watching it, seeing where it was going. And he pinged me with some anomalies that it didn't look like the data was being reported correctly. And I went back because I have videos and I track all this stuff. I was able to go back and actually pull up videos from the past and compare it to data on their website. And their data was not matching what was in the video at the time. So um, I've mentioned it in the comments. I've dropped um, RT Live. I do not recommend using RT Live anymore. It's not clear what's causing those data discrepancies or why. Um, I just, I, I want, I've recommended it a few times when I went in and looked at, I couldn't make the numbers work in my head and it was a black box. I couldn't figure out how they were doing with it. I don't have a good, uh, recommendation for COVID tracking. What I do have is an alternative. This one was shared to me, I think by Stefan, um, who's a muleteer and it's a, the website again is in the, um, link for the video and it shows, you can see, uh, again, it's a, a coronavirus map of the United States. You can look up here, RT. And, and so you can see state level reproduction values. What I like about this one, you know, I'm not gonna vouch once burned, twice shy. I'm not gonna vouch for the data on this, but it's one you can use as an alternative to RT line and look at it. One thing I like is they do have regional level analysis. So you can look at a region in addition to a state. And this is where you have um, New England, Mid-Atlantic, Midwest, South, Southwest, West, right? And you can look here, positive rates. So you can see here in the South, it's growing. Southwest, it's growing. You can see in the Mid-Atlantic, this was the peak in New York and New Jersey. Laura mentioned that they're finally lifting in Newark. But you can also see here deaths uh, occurring. Obviously, a lot more deaths in, um, during the super cluster. And all of the deaths are generally declining, which was in, in copus of that. But as you get to, um, you know, these, you can look up tests to see what their testing rates are, how good their tests are, or percent positive. Remember, lower is better on percent positive. It's getting, means they're getting, and you can see most of them now are, um, they really need to be down here in the 0.5. Most of them are under 0.10, but, um, you know, under 5, 3%. Looks like in the Southwest, they're a little high. This is just another website you can use as an alternative to RT Live. Um, it does have RT, but I'm not going to get in the business of endorsing RT values anymore because, you um, I'm just worried that the data, if, if they have these black boxes, the data gets too tricky to parse. Um, yeah, so look, let's go back and look at any more questions. So that's the, I think that's the update for today. Remove the website, replace the new one. Also, again, thanks for Tyler for staying on top of that RT Live and finding out those errors. Um, Uh, general reliability of antibody testing. Kevin's asking about that. So for those who don't know, antibody testing, so uh, comedy of errors. The CDC releases a um, botches the test for positive tests of coronavirus. They completely botch it in January, February, March. As a result, the FDA says we're going to allow anybody, we're going to do an emergency waiver and allow anyone to get an antibody test. Again, the difference is testing positive means I have coronavirus. Antibody means I have had in the past and have recovered from coronavirus. What that resulted with, the FDA in March said we're going to provide these emergency waivers and about 170 to 200 different antibody tests came out and no one knew if they worked. <laughs> it was like the opposite, but equally bad of you didn't have any tests that may have worked and now you have tons of tests, none of which worked. What's happened since then in beginning in sort of mid-April throughout May is the FDA has gone back and revalidated tests. And there's probably now two or three good tests that have a high confidence rate. They've got a low false positive, false negative rate. But um, all the research when it comes to antibody testing that was coming out in April and saying, ah, tests in Los Angeles mean 30% of the population have it. Tests in New York means 20% have already got it. I wouldn't rely on those. They were all using the sketchy ones and it's going to be hard to go back for a layperson and figure out which test were they using and was it later validated? So I would only rely on antibody testing that comes out probably late May to this time uh, using the new validated measures. Now, other countries, I don't know. 
whether their tests are better or not. So if you see research in other companies, I know Germany's produced some research, they may have better testing and they may have had better controls, but then you would have to read German, which I don't. Uh, Beth, good to see you. Um, Jeremy Norton's asked, what would be a better name than defund the police? That's for people who are communications and marketing majors to decide, not me. I mean, come on, Jeremy, you see what I do on my charts and videos. I'm the last guy you want to talk to about accessible naming and conventions. That's just not my skill set. I know what bad looks like because it looks like what I do, but um, I would say that there's probably probably some good ideas out there. It might be a crowdsource. And remember, the original Black Lives Matter itself was not the original name coming out of Ferguson. It was um, hands up, don't shoot. And these things do evolve and change. And we take for granted that what, through this emergent process, the first thing is going to be the final thing. I don't think that needs to be the case at all. You could have um, a new name come up that's different than Defund the Police, has a better representation, and get spread. And um, yeah, some people are some people are suggesting some names. I would go with people who have better linguistic skills than me. Other questions on the protests, what's going on with those and the sort of the declining violence, anything to do with the systemic funnel or coronavirus? I mean, we're, we're doing pretty good on time here. Yeah, and Ed, Ed brings up, a, Michael, good to see you. Ed brings up a good point. There are some people who are going to complain because it's a resistant action. They don't want to adopt the change. They'll complain on whatever it is. Um, but I think also there's some valid concerns that um, – Everything I've seen about defund the police is that it doesn't mean what it says. It means this really long thing. And that seems to be like a good way to stumble. You want to come out of the gates. Remember, the goal of nonviolent uh, resistance movements is to get 3.5% of the population mobilized. That means getting way outside your comfort zone of who you're used to talking to and who gets it and who knows it and who thinks these things and reaching a much larger uh, percent of the population. You look at the gay rights movement. As they were moving in, they didn't have hashtags or Twitter or anything like that, but they advanced very successfully on gay marriage by capitalizing on value-based statements that attracted large percents of the population. And I think you're going to want to see something like that. And again, it's not my place to change these names. They aren't my names, but I think it's a valid concern. <clears throat> Um, here, yeah, Mike Morrison's asking thing. Any comments on the World Health Organization statements on asymptomatic not being as contagious? Um, if you waited a day, that story changed. I saw that story on uh, a Molotir's uh, Facebook, and I was like, oh, that's odd. I'm going to wait for more research, see how it comes out. And in 24 hours, they walked it back. So there is a distinction they were making that was a very technical distinction between pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic. And even they screwed it up, and I, I hope I don't screw it up here. Pre-symptomatic is you have it, but it's not clear yet, and you will get symptoms. Asymptomatic is you have it, and you never get symptoms. Adding to this complexity is the concept of a super spreader, which for some reason has an enormously high viral load. Remember, the, the coronavirus is transferred by viral particles. You need 1,000 viral particles, you're infected. So a super spreader has an enormous viral load and is asymptomatic. Between these complexities, I think what the WHO was trying to say is that the pre-symptomatic spread is not as, as contagious as the symptomatic spread, but they kind of stumbled the whole thing. And if you go look at those now, Mike, they've walked back the whole thing and said, get back to us later. We're, we're circling around and, and gazing at our navel. Um, Tyler's asking uh, whether certain states, Texas, Arizona, South Carolina, have political or personal will to go back into lockdown now, even though conditions are worse when they first locked down. It seems like the ship has sailed. What does that mean for other states, the country as a whole? So I think we're at the point where coronavirus has become so politicized and so taken into the red and blue meat grinder of rhetoric that at this point to reenter, so we talk about the hammer and the dance. We're technically dancing now, even though we don't have the right dance shoes, clothes, music, skills. Um, <laughs> you know, we're supposed to be out of the hammer. But to go back into the hammer, I think what it's going to take is death. Death is the great neutralizer. It cuts through a lot of rhetoric. You know, you talk about you can't message an externality. Um, and right now, you can message COVID because up to this point, it has been regionally disparate. The impacts are not as well thread. I could have large communities that have no deaths in them, and they don't understand that just down the road is another community that has a lot of deaths in them. To see states go back into lockdown at this point, I think, is going to require – 
a massive spike in deaths in those states where they recognize it. Texas is not going to rely upon, and Kevin is the resident Texan, may tell us differently, but Texas is no longer going to rely upon what's happening in Florida or Washington state. They're going to look at Texas. If Texas has a severe outbreak, though, and lots of Texans are dying, they're not going to care what the other states are going to do. They're going to do to themselves what they think needs to be done. And this is the kind of crisis-like nature that death tends to cut through a lot of rhetoric. And until those death rates increase, I don't think you'll see the political will return. Uh, Mike Morrison asked, do you think 3.5% is still the necessary? And this is referring to nonviolent change with social media. I think so, because I think social media is an amplification of um, signal, but not an amplification of force. And, and by force, I don't mean violent force here. I mean like physics force. When you think about momentum and force, you're thinking about the ability to exert pressure. A lot of social media is just noise and signal that's easy to ignore because you're not in your echo chamber. Um, it, it, it happens at such a volume that we become kind of immune to it. But active, the 3.5% is people who are out actively putting their lives, uh, the, the focus of their lives is on this movement. It's not just I support it or I'm willing to answer a poll. You're out there supporting whether it's protests or mobilization or general strikes. You know, when you look at solidarity um, in uh, um, Poland, they did general strikes. The trade union, um, the trade unions would do general strikes. They had to be supported by a population. So the 3.5 percent is a very committed, intense part of the population. I think the social media gets the word out. And when you think about time, it may shorten the time it takes to get to that 3.5 percent because the, the knowledge is instantaneous. But it doesn't necessarily make people more likely to do it. They've still got to be motivated to do it by something. Any thoughts on the Georgia election, what that means for November? You know, um, it's too early to know what exactly went wrong with Georgia besides everything. For those who don't know, the primary was yesterday. They had long lines. Um, a lot of polling stations had been closed. So I think we're going to have to wait for the postmortem on the Georgia election to see. Thoughts for November is that uh, with the pandemic, everything is harder and states aren't always that good. Georgia has never been historically good at running elections. Um, I don't think the pandemic helped the model at all, and there's been a lot of shenanigans going on with the state officer of elections. So I think for November, as much as they can, um, putting out requests so that people can request absentee ballots would be the way to go, um, if there's still a pandemic going on, which I think there will be. Uh, Chris KP, good to see you, KP, asks, how much of a risk is there of refusing to lock down if there are deaths within the state, but primarily within marginalized community? I think, I mean, if you think about it, after the protests, there is no longer a rhetorical argument to lock down. There's, there's none. You just had a 500,000 to a million people, largely in states that have social distancing, all ignore them. So to some extent, the people ignoring the lockdowns because they wanted to get hair salons, you know, you can say that's not valid and the protesting is more valid but the reality is i think in the rhetorical space we are there's no um good argument right now that's going to convince people absent deaths in their own neighborhoods and it's given you talked about marginalized communities given how segregated we often are i mean even a lot of the deaths in massachusetts were clustered in chelsea city or chelsea chelsea is a largely immigrant neighborhood it is not interacting it's interacting with other parts of the city by way of worker transfers, you know, going to work in places, but people who live in other neighborhoods, even two miles away, may not feel that impact because it's not their community. So I think the segregation of communities means that there's not going to be a lot of this. Um, unfortunately, we tend not to have a lot of concern for one another anymore, which is unfortunate, but seems to be the reality. So I think it's going to have to take local, uh, what I call third degree deaths. First, you think about your seven degrees of separation. Your first degree is someone in my family dies or a close friend. Uh, or excuse me, someone in my family's died. Your second degree is a close friend to me dies. A third degree is a important person to a close friend dies such that the pain of the friend transfers to me. Um, and I'm not saying friend on Facebook or social media. I mean, real friends, someone you know that by way. If those deaths are not incurring in that three degree network, I don't think they're going to have the impact of we need to go on lockdown. And, uh, Christy, answer this later after actual... Well, we're at the point, we're almost at the top of the hour, so we're ready for silly questions. Is Bonky wearing a Pooh Bear shirt? Um, that's a, that is a Pooh Bear shirt. Great, great job, Christy. Good identification. That is a Winnie the Pooh Bear um, 
rag actually not shirt and it's clipped on the back as best i could make it It, they don't really make masks in his size the whole donkey nose is a point of um challenge um speaking of bonky uh if you haven't yet donated to the or subscribed to the InfoMullet, check out us out at www.patreon.com slash InfoMullet. $5 a month to become a mulleteer. We have lots of mulleteers on here. I appreciate. And also, if you haven't yet, like, share, follow the InfoMullet. We do a lot of news reports through the week uh, and as well as articles. And share the video. I'm going to give a couple more minutes if there's any follow-up questions, and then we're going to wrap it up because we're at the top of the hour. Appreciate everyone coming out today. And uh, let's make sure I'm, I'm going to go one last scroll through the questions see if i missed any yeah ed points out for burglaries insurance makes people far more whole than the police that's a good point uh uh stefan shared a really good um article Kevin brings up a point about the defund the p- police about whether it was deliberately architected to be provocative. That's possible. I've wondered the same thing myself. I went to um, Hamilton 68 to see if I could find any indications of that. I couldn't see that it was, you know, in some cases you can go back and trace that something was started by Russian bots or Chinese bots, you know, foreign government bots. I didn't see that with defund the police. It doesn't mean it's not. These things can happen, but um, Good discussion. Love the discussion of everyone. I think I got everyone up. Oh, Farrell, good to see you. Welcome. All right. Uh, yeah. Defenestration of the defenestration of Prague. So, yeah, defenestration of Prague. What a great name that was. That was provocative. <laughs> Those, those bohemians. All right, everyone. Uh, making a reformation joke it means it's time to call it quits. Uh, thanks, everyone. If you can, stay inside. If you can't, wear a mask and stay distance. Be safe out there and uh, take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to follow the InfoMullet, visit us on Facebook or Twitter. And if you'd like notifications when we post new video content, click on the red subscribe button below the video. If you've ever wanted to become a mulleteer and support the InfoMullet, visit us on Patreon. We appreciate the support.